When I was young, I would often hike these hills. But I knew if I didn't get outside that I'd just want to cry. My father was the oldest son of Ernest Hemingway. Cheers. Cheers. It was kind of like the Kennedy family. The Kennedy had these horrible tragedies, and we were sort of the other American family that had this horrible curse. My grandfather, Ernest, was one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, and yet he suffered tremendous mental illness. I come from seven suicides, perhaps more. My sister, Margo, was obsessed with the whole mystery of Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> the, I love bullfighting. I love great wine. I love great living. This is my grandfather's house. He spent a lot of time there writing, and that's where he took his life. She idolized the very thing I hated about my family. Drink the wine. My parents fought all the time. No. No. I would clean up the blood, the glass. We were good wasps, you know? You don't speak about your problem. I really haven't told you that much about the family and all the suicide stuff, because I don't think that I ever wanted you to feel burdened by it. I want to change the dynamic and I want to change the viewpoint that it's not a family of tragedies, it's actually a family of complete and total like embrace of joy. They say in spirituality, you're done with something when it doesn't affect you anymore. I'm not there yet. is actually coming out in June, the beginning of June. And that's really the philosophy behind living a good life. But for me, it saved my life. And I'm not saying that's the only solution for everybody, but it's a piece of the mental health issue that is being ignored. And I speak at the McLean Hospital, and I do speak about that. And I was nervous to be, they honored me for something, I don't know. <laughs> we're being crazy. Um, and um, they honored me, and I was actually really nervous because, you know, it's a, it's a big hospital, and they prescribe a ton of drugs. And I was like, it's not that I don't believe in that, but I said, you know, lifestyle's a big deal. And they said, this is great. I, I was so relieved. They said, no, we really want you to know that we realize that we kind of left that piece out, and we want to re-implement the lifestyle piece into the world of mental health. And I was so pleased because one of the things that my partner Bobby Williams and I um, talk about, and Bobby Williams wrote the book with me, Running With Nature, and he's also my other partner and I love him. <laughs> and um, one of the things that we love to talk about is we like to take the I out of illness and add we and create wellness. And what I mean by that and what we mean by that is that when we add we, we've created community. And when we create community, we create conversation. And when we create conversation, then the word gets out about mental illness, wellness. Because the community is what's going to change this. The more we talk as family, as friends, you know, as community, we will get the word out about mental illness and we will destroy this, the stigma that it, that's attached to it. And the sad thing is, you know, there's probably more mental illness than there is in all the other diseases that I spoke about. And it happens in, in lives of not, you know, not lives about schizophrenia, but just in our simple everyday lives with stress and all these other things. So, and I'm kind of preaching to the choir because I know all of you have some understanding of this. But the more we get out there, the more we speak out. And that's why I made this movie Running From Crazy, so that you all could see it's okay, we're not alone. And so now I'm gonna introduce, first of all, my Profiles of Hope, which is the LA County uh, Mental Health uh, Profiles of Hope. Is that correct, I got it right? <laughs> Yay! Um, and they did a profile on me, so you're first gonna see that profile, um, which also supports Prop 63, which I'm so 
grateful that it has passed and they're doing wonderful things. And we might be the only state in the country that actually has this program, which is really pretty incredible. of yourself that can help you or love you the way you need except you you know this is what I talk about to people I know a lot about how to how people can live a better life how they can be happy how they can not fear stuff that I've feared my whole life but sometimes it's such a misunderstanding of the being I really am you know and I get that I often say it I'll speak to groups of people I yeah I know you think you know me you know, yeah, tall, blonde, no problems. Well, what does she have to say to me? I say that, of course. I get it. I would think the same thing. Guess what? Bunch of funky shit in my family. You know, I'm scared too. Drink the wine. My mother and father drank wine every night, and they called it wine time. Always my favorite. <laughs> and wine time started about five. And my mother would sit on the countertop in the kitchen and her feet were like cross in the sink. Every night, same place. You know, they'd have one glass of wine and things were kind of happy. And they were actually having a regular conversation. You want me to do that? No, I'm fine. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine. But after a couple of glasses of wine, and the alcohol kicked in, nastiness would happen. Uncomfortable, I can't remember why it would start, but there was some switch would happen. Somebody's thrown a bottle against the wall, somebody gets cut. My mother would storm off to her bedroom and my dad would go down into the basement where he lived in his land of seclusion. And I would clean up the dinner party, the blood, the glass, it's just a, just weird, like it was the most normal thing to do, like that's what you did. This is my grandfather's house. He spent a lot of time there riding and of course, that's where he took his life. I've always felt that if, if somebody can't go on living and, and creating the way they can, I mean, the way they're used to, and in healthy form, in which grandpapa was accustomed to, I mean, I accept the fact that he, that he killed himself. I always avoided right in here. This is where he killed himself. I was in my late 20s when I found out. I never knew. And somebody said, well, yes, and this is where it happened. And I was like, wow, I was so blown away. I just had no idea that this was it. But I would not come in here as a kid. Totally freaked me out. Felt like a basement, you know, like a creepy basement that you didn't want to go into. And of course, it was just the kind of the back door to the outside. But um, it's like something kept me away. Okay. I get very nervous. Everybody does. If you don't, there's a problem.
Cool. Cool. All right. Wow. Okay. It's in the 40s. Yeah. Snow melt. It's cold. It's snow. It's liquefied snow. I feel. And legs are egging right now. All right. How are your feet? My feet are fine. The only time I ever felt comfort was just out in the elements, looking up at a mountain, listening to a river. Only time I felt sane. In the house, everything felt dead. I spent a lot of time swimming in icy cold rivers. I would often crack ice to jump in cold water. I liked anything that made me feel alive. For the first time last week, I went all the way across it. I was very excited. Oh, yeah. Whoa. Keep walking. More, more. You won't fall, right? More, no. Kick up as hard as you can. Don't worry about trying to knock me off. Okay. If you don't kick up enough, you won't be able to get a... There you go. So cool. I woke up in my mom and her boyfriend Bobby's house one day, and I walked to the bathroom. I was like, I think I just saw my mom on the trampoline. And then I go back to the window, and my mom does a backflip. A backflip. I stood there for a moment and she did it again and I was like, what, who are you? <laughs> Bobby's always been a kid. And for me, I don't think I had a childhood. Oh, get off me. <laughs> I learned how to play in the last two years. I never knew how to play. having your 200th um, anniversary and I'm having my 50th birthday on Tuesday. I don't know why that's making me cry. <laughs> um, because it's taken this long It's taken this long for me to be able to say that I'm okay and that I love myself and that the journey I've been on has been worthwhile. And it's taken this long for me to be able to say I've had my journey with worrying about that. It's now time for me to step into the shoes of helping other people with this journey. Mental illness is so unsuspecting. It's so secretive. It's so difficult. But I think together, with our ability to be open and compassionate, and loving towards ourselves and those around us, we can really do some extraordinary things in this country. And you're certainly doing it 
in this room, every one of you, I can feel it. I can feel that you have, you're making a difference. Just being here, even if you're just supporting, if you're just a trustee, whatever it is, if you're, a, you're somebody with a, with a friend or a family member, whatever it is, your, your energy and your compassion is what will change this issue so that it can be the forefront and people can get away from being so fearful. Because I was fearful my whole life. And I can honestly say, now, almost 50, I've got two more days, <laughs> that I'm not afraid anymore. And I am so honored that I would be able to be in front of you and be able to talk about, really, my life. It's not separate of me. Mental illness in my family is not separate. It's a part of me. And I'm really thankful to all of you for allowing me to share it with you. So thank you. Mm -hmm.